today on Keys to Kingdom Living. The, the world is not responding to, to timid, weak, pale-faced pastors. Pale because the blood's gone out of their face because they know the Holy Spirit's told them to preach the truth and they deny the truth and preach what they think you want to hear. So you won't get offended at them. But that day is coming to a close. God's going to reject them, and God's going to raise up 7,000 like he told uh, uh, Elijah. He says, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to, to Baal. These, these guys and gals have not bowed their knee to political correctness. They're not going to bow their knee to any pressure, any intimidation from, from the leaders of the world because they're going to have a boldness inside of them because they're going to be free from the flesh, the lust of the the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life, and something's going to get inside of their heart that's so going to infect them and affect them that they're going to preach even if it costs them their life. They will do it, and the world will respond to their boldness and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Get ready, it's coming. The day that, the, listen, the day that Satan has owned America is coming to a close. I said the day that Satan rules over America is is quickly coming to a close. I bring you greetings in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. I'm so excited, and here's why. Today, God has allowed us to connect because he has a very special word. It is entitled, How to Experience the Goodness of God. And this message takes two programs in order for you to receive it in its entirety. So be sure and tune in next week. But today, get ready to be absolutely blessed by the powerful word of the living God. How to Experience the Goodness of God. It's the goodness of God. And we want to know how to experience the goodness of God, especially living in a fallen world. Can I get a witness? Romans 8, verse 1. You're talking about Paul having a great day of revelation in the Spirit when he wrote Romans 8. Wow. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but terms and conditions apply. See the small print for details. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. See, the law of sin and death was at one level, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus was at a whole nother level. And it has made us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You're free if you're a Christian from the law of sin and death. You got to know what the word says or you'll be destroyed from a lack of knowledge. You're free from the law of sin and death. You don't have to live up under condemnation. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, because man is flesh, according to God speaking to Noah in Genesis chapter 6, when he says, I shall destroy man. It was weak through the flesh. Man couldn't keep the law. So God said, I'll make another way. And God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you walk according to the Spirit, you don't have a law. You don't have to keep laws because the Spirit is not going to tell you to do something to violate God's will. For those who live according to the flesh do what? They set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, Christians, is what? It's death. But to be spiritually minded is what? Not just life, but life and peace. What good is life if you can't have peace? God wants us to have life, but he also wants us to have peace so we can enjoy our life. The world doesn't want you to live in peace. Have you noticed that? If they get your ear for five minutes, they're going to have you so tore up and, and in turmoil because they don't want to give you peace because they're not serving the Prince of Peace. We are. God wants you to have life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity, hostile, and enemy against God. For, watch this, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. 
So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Wow. We better not be in the flesh, had we? Have you noticed the stress that is in people's hearts and lives and on their faces recently? There's a lot of stress. People are wound up tighter than a banjo string. Have you noticed if there is any stress in your life? Can I get some honest answers here? And somebody came up with that saying, too stressed, too blessed to be stressed. We're still working on that sometimes. We have to ask ourselves as Christians a question, and we must be honest with ourselves about that question. Here's the question. Why am I, as a Christian, a child of God, living under stress when Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he lives in me? Think about that. He is the Prince of Peace. He's living in us, so we should have peace, not stress. I'm preaching to myself. I got this first. There is so much of God, so much of his goodness that we as Christians and humans forfeit simply because we're willing to live with stress when we shouldn't. Have you ever caught yourself living with stress? And you, you run into it in the hallway. You say, why are you in my house? You don't belong in my house. And you say, it's time for you to leave the house. You're not paying rent no way. You have to catch yourself when you find out there's stress in my life because it's not supposed to be there. Are there things in your life that aren't right? Give you a moment to think on that. If you can't think of any, nudge your spouse and they'll tell you. <laughs> are there things in your life that are just not right? But you let those issues go because you're not willing to address them. No, God didn't tell me what to preach to you. He said preach it to everybody. And it'll hit the ones that need it. <laughs> when we know the good that we ought to do, but we do not do it, God calls this sin. This brings us to the point of reading the verses that we found here in Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but we've got to qualify that by saying, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So we've got to walk after the Spirit. We've got to let the Holy Spirit lead us, guide us, and fulfill us, strengthen us, heal us, deliver us, and supply all of our need through Christ Jesus that we need. Just because we're born again by the Spirit of God and He dwells in us, He isn't going to override our will, even though it was supposed to already be submitted to God at the moment you and I became saved. Wow. When we know in our hearts the things that we ought to address and deal with in our lives, but then we don't really do it, but we proclaim procrastinate taking care of them. What we're doing here, y'all, is we open up ourselves to all types of issues such as stress. If I name yours, just slip your hand up, put it back down. Stress, guilt, shame, trouble, problems, and sin, which produces fear in us. And we're Christians, y'all. When we know in our hearts the things that we ought to address and deal with, but we procrastinate, we put off doing them, then we're opening our own hearts up to all types of issues such as stress, guilt, shame, trouble, problems, and sin, which produces fear inside of us. And God says, I didn't call you to live in those places. I called you to live in peace. If you are currently stressed over a problem, but you haven't done anything to correct the root cause of the problem to head off even greater problems and stress and fear, ask yourself why you're putting off the inevitable. Getting real quiet here. What you may not be aware of is this. When we know there's an issue, but we're unwilling to deal with it or address it or to use the power of Christ and his word to overcome it, we're allowing our flesh nature to rule our heart. 
We are. Because the Spirit of God is not going to tell us to avoid a problem when the problem needs to be dealt with, when the Spirit of God is telling us to deal with it. So if we're not dealing with it, it it's an indication that we're letting the flesh nature, self, rule our heart and our life, and it will be used by Satan through our disobedience to cause all types of stress brought on by fear, guilt, shame, and the list goes on and on. The Christian who lives to please their flesh and also chooses not to do what they know in the heart is right for them to do in God's sight. They're giving in to the weaknesses of their fleshly desires, and this will produce death in us, which is brought on through troubles. Troubles. The purpose of trouble is to trouble you. In case you didn't know that. Trouble causes trouble. Let somebody in a, a patrol car show up your door, knock on the door, and says, are you so-and-so? Yes, I am. We need to come and talk to you. You know that's not going to be a nice visit. And it's going to trouble you because you sense trouble. God. The world wants to trouble us. Because the world is up under the dictates of Satan, the God of this world. And it is his ambition and endeavor and goal to cause us to be in trouble all the time. He wants to rob us of our peace in Christ Jesus. He wants us to rob us of the things that God has given to us. And he does that through our flesh nature, y'all. That we're supposed to die to. Deny self. Take up your cross and follow him. And you will have a life free of trouble. Now they can trouble you. And they could cause you problems. But that's not your trouble. God. Just because they accuse me of things I didn't do. Just to cause me trouble. That's not my trouble. That's not my problem. Somebody's about to get free because you've been believing because somebody said something against you. Somebody did something against you. Somebody set you up to take a fall, Joseph. That that's your problem. It's not your problem. When you're operating by the flesh, you assume that as your problem and you take ownership of it. God. Then you're tore up. You're in stress. Your heart rate's going through the roof. And God's up there saying, look at them. They don't realize they're letting their flesh tear them up. This isn't their battle. I sent my son to Jesus on the cross to die for their sin, and I took the battle upon him. The battle belongs to the Lord, not you. So next time you get troubled over something and you didn't bring it on yourself, tell that trouble to take a hike. You're not mine. See, see, I learned something a few years ago. Anybody get mail you don't want? I do. Addressed to different people with different names that don't live here. I said, I'm getting tired of this, talking to the postmaster one day. I said, what can I do to stop this? They said, just write refused on it. Buddy, I get my pen out every time I see paper. I mean, I write big old R-E-F-U-S-C-E-D. I refuse this in the name of Jesus. This thing has come to pass. It ain't coming to stay. I'm not owning this. I'm in Christ Jesus. They tried to bury Joseph, did they not? They put him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. Uh, Potiphar's wife lied on him, falsely accused him, ended him up in prison, and through it all, he said, this isn't my battle. Wouldn't it be nice if we could live that way? This isn't my battle. I'm not going to own this problem. I'm not going to own this illness. I'm not going to own this issue that's coming against me. This is not mine. Jesus has already taken care of this issue 2,000 years ago. Jesus, somebody is knocking at the door, and it's for you, not me. This is how we overcome, y'all. Instead of living in bondage and being a, a persimmon Christian, 
sour looks on our faces all the time. We've got to put to death self and the flesh and quit procrastinating because we don't want to deal with things that's going to end up being trouble because if you don't deal with problems, they will become your problem. They will. Ignore a health issue. Well, if I ignore it, it'll go away. Let me know how that works out for you. Stand on God's word and address it. Look in Galatians chapter 5. God's speaking to us so clearly and plainly in these messages because he wants us to get it so that we can have and enjoy this life to the full and stop allowing the enemy in this world from troubling us. In Galatians 5, God really gives Paul some serious insight into the things of the flesh and the, thing, the fruit of the Spirit. And he breaks that down for us so we can know what we're dealing with in our own lives and in other people's lives and family members' lives so we know how to address it in prayer and in counsel. And it picks it up in verse 15. It says, but if you bite and devour one another, see, that's what stress does. It turns us on one another. Beware lest you be consumed by one another. And that's happening in this nation right now. People are being consumed by one another. They just amp it up every time they get around each other. Drama upon drama. But I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't do anything that grieves or quench the Holy Spirit, but walk in the Spirit, and you will not, as a Christian, fulfill the lust of your flesh. That right there is worth the drive, wasn't it? If I walk in the Spirit, I won't fulfill those things that Satan is tempting me to do through the weakness of my flesh that's going to get me in trouble, quench and grieve the Holy Spirit, and then I get brought before the Father for correction. Don't go there. Just walk in the Spirit. Well, they irritate me. Pray for them, that will irritate them back. If you do good to evil, God says it will heap hot coals on their head. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another. So when you're walking in the flesh but you're a born-again child of God, you're walking in two different directions. That's not good, is it? It's called confusion. The spirit is against the the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Uh-oh. So if we're walking in the flesh when we should be led by the Spirit, and, and the flesh is causing us to fulfill the lust of our flesh, and we're disobeying God, then we won't be able to do the things that we want to do or should do. Boy, God's really nailing us to the wall on this, isn't he? He's given us no out and no excuse. You're causing trouble in your own life by not addressing the things that you know that you should address, but your flesh won't let you address them, so you put them off hoping that God will deliver you at the last moment, and then you deal with the stress of all the trouble that not doing what you're supposed to do brings on you. So when you fulfill the lust of the flesh and you're not walking by the Spirit, you won't be able to do the things that you ought to do. This is good preaching. Thank you. <laughs> but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Wow. you talking about freedom. When you really, truly sell out yourself and your heart, and not to lust, but to, to Christ and to glorify him in your life, you're not up under a law. You're not up under bondage because you break a law. You're up under God's grace, and that does not give you a permission to sin. It gives you a grace to get it right while you commit a sin. You're not up under that, but you're free from that. You're free from the bondage. That's freedom. That's liberty, isn't it? Now, the works of the flesh are these, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. Do you see any of these in the world? Do you see any of these in the body of Christ? Yes. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the lack of which 
I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. See, now the first thing was the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are things that we do. But the fruit of the Spirit is something that God does in us. It's not our works. It's the fruit or the result of the Spirit working in us. And when we let him work in us, he's first going to work in us love because everything else fails when it's not done through love. Then he's going to give us joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And then thirdly, he's going to give us peace. See, he's got to work these things out in our life as we allow him to work these things out in our life. But if we won't let him work these things out in our life, he's got to put us on the potter's wheel, put us through many afflictions so that we'll humble ourselves so that he can work out these fruit in our life, starting out with love, joy, then peace. Then when you get those perfected, he really amps it up to where now he's perfecting long-suffering. I was thinking about this yesterday. How many has ever been short with somebody? Where did they come up with that term, they're being short with me? What it means is you have no patience for them. Well, the Bible says I've got something for that impatience, that shortness. It's called long-suffering. When God says you won't let me teach you patience, I'm going to let you have an occasion where you're going to have to suffer long. I don't like that. I want it over fast. I'm a sissy when it comes to suffering. Do I have any partners up in this house that feels my pain? I want it over as quickly as possible. So I learn real quick, you obey fast. And after he gets long suffering worked out in you, he's going to start working kindness in you. Goodness, mm -hmm. faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Wow. There's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. So if you operate in the Spirit and he produces the fruit in you, these fruit that we just read off, then you're going to have peace. There's no law, y'all. You're not in bondage to keep a law. How many ever tried to keep the law? You used to worship only on Saturday? That's in the law. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, seventh day of the week. When believers choose to procrastinate and ignore the things that we know that we should, if we continue living for the desires of our flesh instead of obeying the Holy Spirit, we will eventually give in to greater sins. Giving in to your flesh should be a warning to you. Don't do it. Because if you get comfortable as a Christian giving yourself over to the desires of your flesh to respond in anger, when God would say, respond in kindness, then it opens you up because you're desensitizing yourself to responding in the flesh. And what the flesh will do, it will rule over your heart and it will take advantage of you. God told Cain when Cain brought him the wrong type offering. He said, Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But because you're choosing not to do what I told you the way I told you to do it, then sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is to consume you, but you should rule over it. Right? So when we ignore the works of the flesh, and we operate in the bondages of the works of the flesh, and we respond in our flesh instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us, it desensitizes us to those reactions to where then we will start acting without even thinking. And Cain, God said, you should have authority over the sin, but because you won't do what I told you to do and you're doing things in the flesh, it will desensitize you, Cain, and you will do things that are greater in evil than you ever thought possible. And he left from God's presence, went out and got a hold of Abel and killed him. Thank you so much for watching today and for receiving the word of life that has gone forth under the anointing and the power of God's spirit so that he can minister deep unto deep so that the word would resonate with you. The word would let you know he's right there with you. That word, his name is Jesus. I loved how God brought forth the revelation, the understanding 
that brought forth this message so that you could receive that powerful, not only understanding, but powerful impartation of a liberty that we can have as Christians in Christ where we don't fear trouble. We don't fear threats from man because we already fear the one who can destroy according to Jesus and the gospels, both our body and soul in hell. And because we fear him, we don't have to fear what man can do to us. But that comes at a price to get that kind of liberty. We must be willing to die to self, live totally and wholeheartedly for Christ. And that's where that liberty, that goodness is going to flood our being. And we're going to have so much freedom. The world can't stop the body of Christ that is totally sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. God has an army. He's always had an army. But he's about to unleash that army on this world like the world has never seen. His glory in the latter house is going to be greater that than that in the former house. That is his word, and he's doing it in our midst. The move of God starts out like Elijah saw the cloud as the size of a man's hand. And he told his servant, run, for I hear the sound of abundance of rain. And before he could hardly get those words out, there was a monsoon of rain come down on Israel after three and a half years of drought and Baal worship. And because of that miracle, God called the children of Israel up on Mount Carmel and called them to a place of repentance through his prophet Elijah. And when they repented from Baal worship, the fire of God fell and God moved so mightily. That's about to happen in the nations of the world because we love God and he is faithful to perform his word in our lives. Perhaps you're going through a battle of your own and you're not sure there's something in you that tells you that God's going to be faithful, but you're not absolutely positive. God's going to get you through this. If you have that much concern, God sent me with this word today in a prayer to stretch your hand out. Lord, I asked you to be with your child. I asked you to strengthen them right now. I asked for your presence to go right where they are, right to the point of where they're really hurting and wondering, where are you? I loose your Holy Spirit to go to them and anoint them and let them know you've got them and you have the situation. And as they submit in their heart to you to trust in you, like Job said, though you slay me, I will yet trust you. You will show yourself strong on their behalf and they will see salvation and deliverance come out of this situation because of the goodness of God that is in our lives and on our lives because we love and trust Jesus. As God begins showing you his way out of this turmoil that you're going through, through this hard trial that you're facing and wondering if you're going to come out, as you start seeing God's goodness unfold and him making a way, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can contact me personally live at whcnorth.org or you can contact the church office. There we have operators standing by. They will pray with you. They will agree with you. And we will see the salvation of the Lord in your lives. Until this time next week, keep looking up. Our redemption is drawing nigh. God bless you.